Hi everyone, Dr. Samantha Cotrera here for the Imagining a New We video blog, a video series designed to help history teachers and other history educators teach history in ways that are more meaningful, transformative, and inclusive for their students. This is the final Source Saturday video of the 2020 year. It is a very exciting um, because I'm talking to people today about like a winter document, which is really cool. But I just want to thank you all for just like, well, first I want to thank everyone that I got to speak to this year for such a really cool series. I, I really, really enjoyed it. And I really want to continue it next year. Um, but also for you for watching, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting series that I want to keep developing and, and the ideas. And I know this isn't a great year to like get teachers on board to like do another thing of testing, but it's a real, it's a concept that I'm really hoping to continue. And hopefully you'll have a future in which um, we can have more of those discussions. Today, we're talking to people from the Canadian Research Knowledge Network or CRKN. I just feel like it's a mouthful so I have to read it. Um, this is just a fantastic like network organization that does that does digitization as well as like like storing in a repository for all these things. It's all free and I just don't know why like like teachers and other educators aren't using it more. I think it's because they actually don't know about it. So, so the more like the more we can like highlight these amazing collections, the more we can use them. And that's why this source is so great today. We're talking about a source from the 19th century that's a series of like lithographs. So images like uh, sketches and things that um, a British soldier drew with a little bit of narration about his time in Canada and Prince Edward Island. And it's just, it's such a fun, cool source when I was looking at it before the conversation that I can't wait uh, for our conversation about it. And I don't, I'm not just talking with one person about it. I'm talking with two people about it. I'm talking with Francesca Brasecki and Georgina Ashworth, who both work for the Canadian Research Knowledge Network um, and are bringing like their experiences to the conversation. So Francesca is the communications coordinator for the CRKN. And so she does communications outreach events and she it, uh, she's involved with like the heritage program, the CRKN heritage program. She was from Kingston. She has her MA in public history. Um, and so she was at Carleton as well as Queens and yeah, very cool. And then we have Georgina Ashworth, who's also coming um, to this conversation. And she has her master's in heritage and museums from um, the University of Cambridge. So overseas, as well as a BA from McGill. And she is the Heritage Projects and Partnerships Coordinator so for CRKN. So she does stuff related to projects and heritage. And so the communications persons and the heritage person, although I I don't know if there's such a fine line coming together to talk about these sources. I think it's just going to be such a rich and wonderful conversation. So let's go over to Zoom, have our last source Saturday for the season. And if you can tell <laughs> by the, the weird video, like the lighting is just not going to be great. <laughs> if I do any more of these like later afternoon conversations. So um, I'm going to need to figure that out for 2021. Uh, let's go over to Zoom. Hello, both of you. I am so excited to be able to do our last Source Saturday with both of you talking about a winter source. And um, I'm just really excited to be able to bring something from the 19th century because the last few videos that we've done have mainly been in the 20th century. And so thank you both so much for joining me. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Um, before we begin, um, do you want to introduce yourselves and let everyone know why there's going to be two of you on today's video? I mean, technically there's two of us, but she's not going to be talking so much. Yeah, so I'll start. Um, my name is Francesca Brzecki and I am Communications Coordinator at the Canadian Research Knowledge Network. Um, I joined CRKN in 2019. Um, going on two years there now, and I do all kinds of uh, corporate communications for CRKN, and I also am involved with the uh, management and governance of our heritage collections, collections and heritage program. Um, and I'm joined by Georgia, my colleague today, because we're both involved in heritage of CRKN. That's right. Um, I am Georgia Ashworth. I am the Heritage Projects and Partnerships Coordinator at CRKN. 
Uh, and, and with Francesca, I do a lot of work with our heritage collections, which is, uh, we'll be sharing a source from those collections with you today. And we'll talk more about um, the research network at the end of the video, although I think you'll talk a little bit about it when you're introducing the source, but it's it's um it's a network that I don't know a lot of a lot of teachers like know about it as a really rich repository of sources, which is why I'm so excited that we get to end the series by talking to both of you because I'm sure teachers just want to spend their whole holidays going through <laughs> your collections. It's a great way to spend a long winter's evening. Yes, <laughs> just like they did in days of yore. <laughs> by candlelight going through your digital collections by candlelight so what is the source that we have today i'm just gonna share my screen so this is sketches of canadian sports and pastimes it was published in 1870. Uh, first i will mention that uh, this is from the canadiana collections and Francesca's going to talk a lot more about them at the end, but uh, it is really accessible along with a bunch of other Canadian documentary heritage. So this is a collection of lithographs as well as some descriptions by Lieutenant Henry Buxton Lawrence. Um, and he was a British soldier that was posted in Quebec, Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. Um, if I move to this little introduction here, get a little bit more context, you can see that he says Canada and Prince Edward Island. And this is, of course, because Prince Edward Island wasn't uh, yet a part of Canada at, at the time of this publication. Um, so Lawrence has written a little introduction here. You can see that he distinguishes Canada and Prince Edward Island because Prince Edward Island hadn't yet uh, joined Confederation at the time of this publication. And Lawrence was one of the soldiers that was sent to Prince Edward Island during the Tenant League disturbances. Um, the Tenant League was a farmers union that was opposed to the land tenure uh, system. And it, it turned out that military action wasn't really necessary and uh, Lawrence and the rest of the soldiers were quickly sent back to Halifax. Um, so another just a little bit of context before we get into the source. Um, in this introduction, Lawrence gives the, the reason for, for this publication. And that is to uh, show the people of, of England what it is like to spend winter in Canada. Or for those who had already been there, to awaken pleasant reminiscences. Um, yeah. And do you know where Chester Castle is? I do not know where Chester Castle is. Uh, that was I one thing I wanted to look up and I never did. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> well, somebody can look it up um, and then put in the comments what and where Chester Castle is. Um, Absolutely. When uh, he says two years sojourn, do you know if it's like 1868, 1869? Um, I know he was in Prince Edward Island around 1867, just uh, because of the Tenant League disturbances. Uh, but I don't know exactly which years uh, he was posted in North America. And so does he, did he commission the sketches or the, is it his original art? It's his art. Yeah, you can see also in this introduction, um, he, he says he apologizes for their unworthiness. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's an example of like, done is better than best. <laughs> like, mm, yes, but yeah, he's just telling like, himself short a bit. I yeah. think the sketches are lovely. <laughs> um, um, so what do you, so can we see one of the sketches? What do you like read from a source like this or see from a source like this? What are the types of things that, um, that we can kind of pull out to use for teaching and learning? For sure. Uh, yeah, I'll pass it to Francesca to talk about this. 
Um, yeah, so me and Georgia, we both went through this source independently and then we came together and discussed the um, the main takeaways that we had gotten from this source and they actually lined up pretty well. So I think there are some, some key themes we can get out of this and we're just going to talk about them kind of in the order that they appear throughout the book. Um, so uh, as you will see as we go through, um, the book contains like a short description and then uh, a sketch. And this is the first one that we see. It's called coasting. So he makes a distinction between coasting and uh, like tobogganing. Um, so coasting is more of a, it's, it's like a piece of wood on two runners. Um, so you'll see like a couple of different sketches that are similar to this. And one thing that I noticed in these sketches is the presence of women taking part in these um, winter outdoor activities and sports. Um, and I think that that is an important thing to note because there is this popular idea that women in the Victorian period were kind of stuck at home, like doing needlework, cooking and cleaning all day, um, that they didn't really have active lives outside the home. But you can see in these images, um, which, you know, presumably were taken from real experience that this lieutenant had, that there were women who were outside in the winter, you know, in their kind of Victorian gowns, but they were out there, they were getting wet, they were getting dirty, they were having fun. Um, and I think it challenges just that like popular notion that we have of life for Victorian women in Canada. Yeah. Um, and the other, the other thing that stands out to me about this sketch and who is depicted in this sketch is one for one thing it's adults i think when we think about sledding and tobogganing today we think about children and we think about family um but these are are mostly couples and and we can see that they're all adults and the other thing is as francesca mentioned what they're wearing is these are upper class people they're wearing these gorgeous gowns these feathered hats they've got really shiny boots and mustaches and so this is this is not really the the way that most people would picture uh, upper class people in Victorian society as uh, partaking in this uh, sort of childish we would consider today uh, activity and also in these compromising positions. You can see uh, a few of them are in the midst of falling off their sled into the snow. Uh, and that's a, a really interesting a subversion of expectations right off the bat in this source. Could you um, could you zoom in on that couple kind of in the background there that are uh, like is she going face first down the hill? <laughs> like it, I, I love how you both like how you just said like there's this subversion of our expectations because this looks very fun and like kids for example if they saw um, an image like this they would recognize it but but there as you pointed out there are elements that are surprising that aren't as recognizable because <laughs> it's like grown adults having a very good time <laughs> like i don't think i've ever seen such happy faces absolutely um and if we continue uh we have this distinction with tobogganing as francesca mentioned uh, i'll also briefly mention that lawrence points out that tobogganing is uh, an indigenous word and um, this is the first instance of an indigenous presence in this source and it's something that we'll talk about uh, a little bit later on. So here's here's another picture and you can see some of the same elements. These upper class people, these women uh, falling off sleds and, and having fun uh, much in the way that uh, children and families do today. Uh, the other thing I want to point out here, we've got tobogganing specifically uh, at Prince Edward Island. There's a quote here that says toboggan parties in Canada are given much in the same way as croquet parties in England, but if I might presume to give an opinion, offer far more amusement. So here is some uh, confirmation of some of the things we talked about, about this being kind of an upper class activity. He makes the comparison with croquet parties in England, and it's also a positive comparison. He's not saying like, look at these Canadians, they're so uncouth. He's saying actually toboggan parties are a lot more fun. 
Um, and it also uh, points out that uh, because of the winter in Canada, uh, the traditional British activities for fun can't be had. So uh, they need to adapt to the climate in order to still uh, have fun. The photo that goes along with this is also very interesting to me. You can see because Prince Edward Island is fairly flat, they've had to construct this big wooden structure uh, in order to still partake in tobogganing. So you can kind of gather from that the importance of tobogganing in society. Uh, the fact that they would go to all that trouble just to be able to get a proper uh, momentum. And um, I don't know if you noticed this, you said photograph, and of course it's not a photograph, but there is movement to these that really makes it actually feel like a photograph, like, and the details and the personalities, um, like even that background information, like the background um, uh, of like, I don't know, maybe like a factory, like it's kind of interesting how there is this distinction between like here we are playing, we have this fancy house, but also there's people in Prince Edward Island that are still working, you know, like it's really, it's interesting the details of these, um, these images. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. That makes me think of um, that the skating image that you pointed out before as being dangerous, and that yes. one has a lot of detail in it. That one is really fun to zoom in and look at. Oh, it's the next, the next image. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this one reminds me of like a Where's Waldo. Like there's just so much happening here that um, yeah, that's just so that's so very interesting. It's true. The more you look at it, the more you can kind of pick out from the crowd. There's also a quote about this um, that I really enjoy. I'm gonna pull out for you. Um, it says, the center of the rink is set apart for those able to cut figures, etc. Whilst the sides are patronized by the less proficient who can set themselves with whirling round and round in a sort of never ending procession. And that makes me think of how we skate today. I feel like that is exactly the skating etiquette that we still follow. So there is that continuity, not only with the winter activities that they're doing, but also some of the unspoken etiquette for how to skate. And interestingly, I don't feel like these people are following those rules <laughs> at <laughs> all. <True. laughs> Uh, yeah, and once again, we see kind of these upper class people in various states of falling down on the ground. Um, and there's a lot of humor in these sketches, a lot of uh, poking fun. Also, here, just a, hmm. oh, just a fun thing to point out, um, this uh, gentleman at the kind of bottom left corner, um, his skate has kind of broken and fallen off. Um, and I think at this point, they were still attaching skates to their boots, like separately. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they um, didn't have regular skates yet, as far as I know. I could be incorrect about that, but I think at this point, they were still attaching them to their actual winter boots. I think both were available, but this okay. is probably more common. Um, and I actually, when I look at this picture, I don't see as much like upper classness maybe as the the um the last photo i don't know why maybe it's like the men on the right hand side um but it seems like i don't know it seems more like a public space than maybe a private space where people come together and there's also children here i love that you brought in that bit of that quote to be able to get again like uh young people to compare similarities and differences because I mean, other than maybe the age of people here and like the chaos, dangerous chaos, <laughs> it is very similar to what we would expect in our own ranks. Absolutely. Yeah. Even having the side area to put on your skates and warm mm. up the side of the rink. So I'm going to skip through some of these other ones. Uh, there are some examples of other winter activities that people are doing. But then we get to the Royal Mail ice boat. And this gets into a, a little bit away from the, the fun activities and a little more um, some of the harder things about winter in Canada. So Lawrence describes how Prince Edward Island 
um, being an island can be become entirely surrounded by ice in the winter. And it's very, very hard to connect with the outside world for that reason. So they have the Royal Mail ice boat, which is one of the only ways to communicate with the outside world during this time. Uh, and they would, as you can see in this picture, sometimes just have to drag it over the ice themselves. Um, attached with ropes to the boat so that that if they fall in, they have a way to save themselves. And yeah, just was a little bit more of the the challenges of this time period in Canada, um, and particularly Prince Edward Island. That's a great image. Yeah, um, like you can really see the winter here mm -hmm. and the struggle. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely a bit of contrast with some of the, the more fun images at the beginning of this story. Yeah, we spent a few minutes talking about this one and, and how we both kind of assumed that a boat going between, um, I guess, like Nova Scotia and PEI would be like, we kind of both imagined this big icebreaker ship like moving across the Strait of Northumberland. And then when we skipped ahead to, to this page and we saw this tiny boat, we were like, oh my goodness, like people were using that to cross like ocean waters. Um, just incredible what, mm -hmm. what, people, what people did back then to stay connected. Yeah, and I think just about like, you know, we, we certainly still have like the weather to deal with now, but to, if we look, if we just go back to that image really quickly and it's just like, sorry, why would you ever do that? <laughs> like, this looks terrible. But to just think about how important it would be to ensure that connection, both for like important things like, you know, uh, food and medical supplies and things like that, but also like that those personal connections and so many of us because we are um, isolated from families especially families from afar like to be able to just think about how important it is to make those connections and the and like to think of that, that internal struggle with something like that you can kind of understand you can understand like why it's important to ensure that the royal mail is always getting through despite this looking terrible and like literally someone is behind first in the ice right now um yeah yeah that's a good point um i think people are thinking a lot about isolation currently mm -hmm. but this kind of gives a whole new meaning um to what that can look like mm -hmm. um so this is one that i wanted to talk about um Actually, Georgia, if you can go back just one page, um, just to show the title. So this is driving a few friends to mess. Um, and these images, so there's one here and then there's one um, that's following this one, um, which kind of were interesting for me because they show the relationship that um, these soldiers coming from Britain would have with the Canadians um, who were living full time in the cities where they were stationed. Um, so I'm from Kingston, Ontario, which has a long military history and I used to do lots of local history research. So I learned a lot about um, like the relationship between the garrison and the town while I was doing that research. And um, I think it's it's interesting how much they blended and you can see this in these images which show you know some friends coming over to the barracks to to have uh to have dinner essentially with the officers in the uh in the garrison here um and it used to be quite an exciting event when um the soldiers would show up in a new town especially i think for like the young ladies and their mothers perhaps who were looking for them to find a new beau or a new husband um, it was exciting to have um, all these kind of you know many young single men suddenly in the town um, as well it was exciting because and maybe a little bit um, troublemaking as well because there was there's obviously some chaos that can happen when a bunch of like young men show up in town and they're all in one place at one time and yeah you can see that in this image here which shows um, after a, a long night of um, carousing the 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 party that's come to the garrison tries to leave but it's been snowing and they lose their way and they don't hit they don't 
take the right road and then their wagon falls over and they all get dumped into the snow. So a combination of poor weather and perhaps alcohol <laughs> um, could lead to situations like this. Um, so it's to me, this was like a fun detail of the sort of things that um, these officers and their their city friends in, in Canada could get up to. Yeah, I think of the um, I think of like the musical Hamilton, um, the Winter's Ball song when it like starts very formal and then then there's like these little riffs, these hip hop riffs that you know that they're just there to party. <laughs> Uh, and this kind of this back and forth but I mean the humor in this source is so amazing because it with the humor it demonstrates like this humanity that we often like can take from that we often take from our study of the past because we see these images that are so formal but like this is just like this was a mess <laughs> like period <laughs> Absolutely. And I like the fact that Lawrence is often poking fun at himself and, mm. and his position and these things. Um, I think the next one also, the next few, few uh, images speak to this as well, as well as the difficulties of winter driving, uh, which is, again, something people deal with now, but uh, there's a whole another level of difficulty. Um, you can see this is the challenge of having a narrow road, having two people trying to pass at the same time. We also have the challenge of hills. Um, so this is a very funny collection of a, a couple of images. Um, and he describes in his, uh, his text, if you're going down a hill, the sled is going to start going faster than the horse that's in front of you. And the danger of that we can see in the next image, which is that the horse can kick you out of your own sled. And you can see the people running behind the sled over here. Yeah. So it's just like the woman is just like, lying like what <laughs> happened? Those poor horses. I really, I've never considered that. <laughs> Absolutely. He also mentions how, uh, you know, the Canadians and the Islanders know what to do, but these British soldiers just have to learn for themselves. Uh, That's what I was going to say. He mentions, like, we were talking about him poking fun at himself, and he mentions how he, he's, he was warned about this, but he thought, <laughs> oh, I can do it. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I also just wanted to briefly mention, um, bringing up again what I was talking about at the beginning with gender. Like here we have um, a, a young man and and woman who are going on the sleigh ride together. Um, in the text that accompanies this image, um, he makes it clear that this is something that he has done himself. So once again, we have like a, a man and a woman kind of going out on a little date together. Um, and they could do that. They're alone. There's no chaperone or anything. Um, we also have this idea that Victorian life was like extremely prudish, but it was not always for everyone. So um, here in this kind of later section of the booklet, um, the author talks more about the indigenous presence in the areas where he was stationed. And so this, um, you know, being published in 1870, it does use the word Indian a lot. So I'm going to use that word sometimes as I talk about this. Obviously, that's not what I would choose myself. Um, but I think this source is interesting because in contrast to a lot of other um, sources in this period, um, the author takes a, a fairly um, neutral to positive view of the um, indigenous peoples who he encounters. Um, most of all, I think he's just interested in their knowledge. Um, you can tell that Henry Buckton Lawrence himself was interested in, in hunting and, and the same types of activities that the indigenous were also taking part in. So when he does go on, on trips with them, he does these these really detailed illustrations of like in this example the camp that they've set up in the forest and he also has really detailed um, descriptions of their hunting techniques and he just notes them down in a very um, matter of fact um, interested um, neutral way like he it's just it's literally something that he's interested in he doesn't um, uh, denigrate them or or treat them, like patronize them. So both me and Georgia noticed this. And of course, like it is the source of its time. I'm not saying that Henry Buckton Lawrence was some kind of um, 
like social justice visionary or anything like that. Um, of course, people often had, um, you know, positive and negative attitudes at the same time. But I think this source is interesting in that he um, is often, he often acts quite impressed with the knowledge that um, his indigenous friends have um, in this um, source right or this page right here that Georgia is showing he describes um, moose hunting and there is one section um, just looking for it sorry um, no problem. so yeah so they're off hunting about he says 10 or 15 miles away from this camp that they've made um, so you know 10 50 miles that's quite a distance and they're just in the forest um, so he says, after making a few marks here and there on the trees, so as to facilitate the finding of the deer the next day. Okay, so they're hunting a deer in this case. Um, you start off for the camp, perhaps 10 or 15 miles distant, to find which, but for the instinct of the Indian, would be next to impossible. So here he's recognizing that, like, wow, this, you know, due to this knowledge that's been passed down in his own life experience, he's able to find um, a camp in, in the wilderness that... Buckton or Buckton Lawrence himself would never be able to find. So it does show some respect for their their knowledge. It's it is also um, a little bit similar as when he's talking about how the the Canadians know how to drive uh, drive their sleds, but he doesn't. He says like he describes himself as panting along after afterwards and um, how it's so hard for him to sleep in the cold and and uh, yeah his sense of direction. Uh, could you go back to the uh, the camp photo? Oh, see, I did it again. <laughs> the image. Yeah, the image. You know, That's what's interesting guess. is that in comparison to the other ones, the the skating ones and the like, the ice, the Royal Mail ice ones. This one has like this, like this level of detail that's really interesting and far less humor uh, or no humor. I think what's really interesting in comparison from this one to like the other ones that we've seen, the skating one, is that there's like this really interesting level of detail, like all those branches that we can see, like it's very interesting and there isn't the humor that we can see in these other images. And I think to like pick up on what you were saying Francesca I'm also like not seeing this version this British colonial version of like the quote-unquote savages it's like this is <laughs> this is the camp and this is what it looks like and the text that I read really briefly when you had it on the screen looks very similar to what um, what we see here that in this camp there might be one person chopping wood um, but this is what this looks like and that is it is really interesting and I think it's also important to remember how like colonialism isn't one thing it isn't one set of beliefs it it ebbs and flows and morphs and evolves and devolves and there's so many different incarnations of of colonial rule and so while this is under colonial rule and there are certainly elements of it that um, demonstrate colonial out coloniality um it's not in the same ways that we often are just like you know uh that we often kind of associate with this again this notion of like this like savage like that's not what is coming up here which i could imagine there might be even like a bit of a um, an appetite for um in in some british circles to have these 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 like lurid stories because i think of um i think of the interest in like abolitionist literature in england around this time where they were so they hated slavery but they really wanted these very graphic details right so um anyway thank you for bringing that up that's so interesting uh this is the the last image in the collection and the last description uh, and it, again, speaks to a little bit of the danger and the little bit of the challenge of uh, winter in Canada in contrast to some of the earlier fun uh, aspects. So he's talking about uh, driving over the ice um, and how they have to put spruce trees along to show where the safe track is. But if you go at night, sometimes you lose the track. Um, and if you fall through the ice, uh, it's really dangerous. Um, 
again, he puts himself in contrast to the Canadians, who the Canadians don't think very much of it. They always have the proper ropes, et cetera. Um, but the difficulty of trying to get your horse out of the water, of cutting through your sleigh. Um, and he even says that in the spring, they often find a bunch of bodies that are washed up on the beach um, from this. So this, again, is, it's a little bit uh, of a somber end to this mostly lighthearted tour. Um, but it is just a reminder of, of the difficulty and the, the danger that came from living in such a harsh climate um, back in the 1800s. Like how many dead bodies do you think? It, it just says numbers of <laughs> dead bodies. Like it's <laughs> up to imagination. That seems... Uh, and this image too is a little bit dark going through the ice here. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that threw me off. <laughs> I, yeah. I, it's, so it's kind of interesting the way that he is contrasting like the Canadians and the indigenous peoples um, on the land and how they don't have the same kind of struggles that he does. Cause that's because, you know, often we can like the idea of colonialism, we can group whiteness into this one big thing. And so here's this white guy in Canada, um, but like he's an immigrant. And so what, what does, um, you know, like what is that kind of immigrant or migrant experience and how does that kind of compare or contrast? That's kind of an interesting, like, again, that's like an interesting classroom activity to borrow on his like method, maybe not focusing on dead bodies or like, dead horses but um <laughs> but like to say like oh you know when i moved to canada my family moved to canada like we were surprised about this but canadians didn't seem to have an issue and it might have to do with snow <laughs> yeah so those are some interesting like those are just some fascinating thank you so much for this source there's so many fascinating things that you pulled from it how do you think that using a source like this can help us challenge how we normally understand this time period or even just understand this season? I know we kind of talked about things here and there, but I wonder if there's anything that we can pull out. Yeah. The main thing? Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Go ahead, Georgia. No, you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> you were talking for a while there. Yeah. Um, the main thing for me is honestly just how it humanizes um, the people of this time period. Um, I've been kind of obsessed with history from a young age, so it's not a problem for me, but I know a lot of other people, um, history appears very dry to them, I think because it just comes across as like a series of events that happened a long time ago to people who weren't around anymore, so why should I care? But I think sources like this um, show just that people back then were, were just like us, um, they like to have fun, you know, they struggled in their everyday life, maybe in different ways, but um, in a lot of ways also similar today, you know, like they, they liked going out on, on dates, they liked tobogganing, um, and I think this source really shows that, and it shows the humor as well that people had back then. Once again, like I kind of go back to these popular ideas of what Victorian life was like, um, and it's often very somber and serious, but I think you can see in these sketches that it, it wasn't really like that. Um, yeah, so for me, that's kind of my biggest takeaway. And I think um, it would, ho like, hopefully it would be, um, I, I would hope that students maybe studying this source in a classroom would get some of that from studying it. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Francesca. And I think uh, a source like this can really help students to see themselves and to connect their own lives with things in the past. Just, uh, you know, as Canadians in winter, we have to find ways to have fun. And uh, a lot of the ways that they did in the past uh, have carried through to today. Um, yeah. And I can also see like having a reproduction of this and having students just like also just draw themselves into the scene, you know, like they can draw similar scenes, but also draw themselves in like, what would you be doing here? I would be like inside with hot chocolate. <laughs> um, but it, that's, yeah, like there's so many interesting things of the source together and then the individual pages. So thank you for picking such a rich source. Yeah, yeah of course. It was very fun to go through for us as well. 
So where can people find this source and sources like it? So um, this source is from the Canadiana collections, which are managed by um, Georgia and my employer, uh, the Canadian Research Knowledge Network. So um, the Canadiana collections really consist of two uh, main collections. There's Canadiana, which this source is from, and then there's Eritage. So just briefly a little bit about Eritage. It's actually a partnership between us and Library and Archives Canada. So um, on that website, you'll find archival records. Um, they're actually digitized microfilmed reels from LAC. Um, and that's stuff like census records, um, genealogical records, personal papers, things of that nature. Whereas on, it's a bit, um, it's, it's a pretty huge collection and maybe not the best for kind of the age group that you're targeting. Um, but Canadiana is published material. So this is anything that was, that kind of went through a printer and was available publicly to people. So there's um, books, there's magazines, newspapers, journals, advertising, all kinds of things like that. And there's 19 million pages of it. So it's a pretty big collection. Easy. It's super easy to go through this Christmas. <laughs> super easy, yeah. <laughs> um, we do have, it, it. right now it's organized into three kind of sub collections. So we have monographs, which are books, um, serials, which are those um, like magazines, newspapers. And then we also have government publications. Um, one thing that we have gotten a lot of feedback on is to pull out the newspapers and make those more easily accessible. So that's something that's kind of on our to-do list, but it's still to come. However, um, while we only have like one um, initial ser search box on our homepage, as you go through, you can filter um, by year, you can filter by sub-collection, by language. Um, there's lots of different um, search facets that you can use to narrow down your search term and it is processed with optical character recognition. So that means when you search a term, it'll bring up the exact page that that term appears on. So you can find things pretty easily that way. Um, yeah, and as well, um, we have a bunch of projects right now at CRKN to um, develop the projects going into the future. So we're, we're kind of taking a hard look right now about like, what's contained in the collection and how we can um, best manage it and adapt it so it continues to be useful for people going forward. And uh, we always welcome uh, feedback from users and researchers. Um, I guess I'll just say um, our uh, uh, main email is info at crkn.ca. So we're always happy to hear from people. There's a, a couple things I would like to add. One is uh, we're constantly adding to our collection. Um, so there's always going to be new things. And the other thing is um, one way, of course, to explore the collection would just be to search yourself. But uh, I also do feature something from the collection every week uh, on our social media pages. So we have uh, a Twitter, a Facebook, and an Instagram. Um, that maybe uh, Samantha can put in the description. For sure. I for Thanks, and I forgot something that's really important, which is that this is all free to access. So it's access yes. at no charge. <laughs> Anyone can log on and look at it. Yeah, and I think like for teachers, it can be really daunting um, to be able to like sort through stuff, <laughs> period just period, because there's so much there, which is why it was so wonderful to connect, to be able to do this video, maybe others. And uh, we'll definitely like connect with your social media. All those like links and websites will be below the video or below the, or in the podcast description. Um, so that, although this definitely works better as a video. So if someone has gotten this far <laughs> listening to the podcast, you've missed a lot of really great illustrations. Um, uh, because I think it is really great to be able to highlight things because then it's easier to start, start searching. Um, and I also just want to like point people that one of the first videos I did in the Source Saturday series was on newspapers, just like 19th century newspapers in general. And even if it doesn't have like a specific topic, like the things that you can pull from it. And so it's, I'm glad that you mentioned newspapers because it's a good place like repository for sources like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'm also going to say this, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but I'm just going to put it out there that if teachers 
put a comment in the video or contact me about something that they're looking for. Like maybe that can, we can open up that conversation to be able to um, feature or put that link so that we can kind of bring some of those conversations together a little bit more. Um, because yeah, it's hard to know like what to provide and then what to ask for. So maybe this can open up some of that conversation too. Yeah, that would be great. Um, you know, CRKN um, kind of started as an academic library organization and that's still kind of our bread and butter, but we're, um, we're really excited to, to learn just how many people, even you know, international visitors are using the Canadiana collections and we would be really delighted, I think, to talk to um, teachers kind of outside of the academic universe about these, uh, these collections. Outside the academic universe, it's a big, big place. <laughs> I know, yes. <laughs> um, this was so wonderful. Thank you both uh, so much for this. Um, again, all those links are going to be below the video. This is such a wonderful way to end the series this year with this nice wintry um, video. And um, for anyone that is watching and you get your students to do some of this, always like send that work. <laughs> like that would be amazing. And uh, we'll make sure that teachers can connect with you and that, that then you can connect with them. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.